السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي وسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم ما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور مفتتاتها وكل مفتتة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وقال تعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قال ربك للملائكة إني جاعل في الأرض خليفا قالوا أتجعل فيها من يفسد فيها ويسفك الدماء ونحن نسبح بحمدك ونقدس لك قال إني أعلم ما لا تعلمون وعلم آدم الأسماء كلها ثم عرضهم على الملائكة فقال أنبئوني بأسماء هؤلاء إن كنتم صادقين قالوا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم قال يا آدم أنبئهم بأسمائهم فلما أنبأهم بأسمائهم قال ألم أقل لكم إني أعلم غيب السماوات والأرض وأعلم ما تبدون وما كنتم تكتمون وإذ قلنا للملائكة اسجدوا لآدم فسجدوا إلا إبليس أبا واستكبر وكان من الكافرين صدق الله العظيم All praise and thanks be to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the creator, sustainer, nourisher, protector and curer. May the choicest of his blessings and salutations be upon our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family members, his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Tayyami. My dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, MashaAllah, it is indeed a beautiful evening. And I'm extremely happy to be with all of you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this gathering. And may He make this gathering a gathering where the angels shroud us with their wings. And the demons run away from it. And may the sakina tranquility of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descend upon us. And may He the Almighty make high mention of us in the seven heavens. Amen. Before we delve into tonight's topic. And that is angels and demons, we have to understand that this universe that we are living in is full of mysteries, forces, creatures, powers. All of these things surround us. We are basically living in an enigma that we are discovering very, very gradually. We are discovering it gradually as we live in the lap of these forces and mysteries. So, before I go into tonight's topic, there are two things that I wish to touch on. And that is, number one, the wrestling bout between aql versus naql. I'll explain as we go. And number two, in regard to belief in the unseen. In regard to belief in the unseen. These are the two things that I wish to touch before we delve right into the topic. Now, in regard to this wrestling bout, like I said in the beginning... 
between akal versus nakal akal is translated as our logic our intellect and nakal is the text of the quran and the authentic sunnah of our beloved master muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam for many a time we would see there are individuals who deny the existence of the malaika who deny the existence of the angels and we also have people who deny the existence of jinnat they say that there is nothing as jinns these are all superstitions or fairy tales or stories now this is all in accordance to their intellect to their logic they think you know what i'm educated and i think you know these are all old wives tales so this is a contradiction this is aql versus naql just to show how weak our knowledge is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the noble quran surah al-isra wa yas'alunaka 'anir ruh qul ruh min amri rabbi wa ma utiitum min al-'ilmi illa qalila and they ask you o oh muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the soul they ask you about the ruh about the soul say unto them the soul is of the affairs of my lord and mankind has not been given of it okay? mankind has not been given of knowledge in regard to it except a little very recently all that which they found out in regard to the soul is that there was an experiment conducted that a man in the throes of death he was observed and all that they came up with is right after his soul left his body his body went light a few grams this is all they have come up with science cannot talk about the soul they don't know what is a soul or they can't talk about death these are things allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given us a lot of knowledge about look at the incident of musa and khadir alayhi salatu wassalam musa alayhi salatu wassalam was once giving a talk to his followers at that moment there was an individual who got up and asked him ya musa do you think or is there anyone more knowledgeable than you on the face of this earth to which musa alayhi salatu wassalam replies now he assumed that he being the kalimullah he is the one who is speaking to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being a prophet of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he was receiving divine revelation from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he assumed it was not out of pride he assumed that he had to be the most knowledgeable person on the face of the earth at that time and at that moment so without thinking twice he said yes and for that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted musa alayhi salatu wassalam to go and meet khadir alayhi salatu wassalam now we know the incident and i don't want to go into the whole length of the story so anyways musa alayhi salatu wassalam and khadir alayhi salatu wassalam after they both met they embarked on a journey they embarked on a journey and the minute they got on to the boat or the ship that was supposed to take them from one bank of the river to the other bank there was a tiny little bird at the edge of the boat or at the helm of the boat khadir alayhi salatu wassalam now we're talking about two extremely knowledgeable individuals two prophets of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala musa alayhi salatu wassalam khadir alayhi salatu wassalam khadir alayhi salatu wassalam teaches musa alayhi salatu wassalam something He asked Musa alayhi salatu wasalam ya Musa do you see that bird over there at the corner of the boat Musa alayhi salatu wasalam says yes Khadir alayhi salatu wasalam then says look at the bird it is dipping its beak into the ocean and the drop of water the tiny drop of water you see that the bird is taking out of the ocean that is the comparison of all of our intellects put together in comparison to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is much more vast than that ocean and our knowledge the knowledge that has been given to us is equivalent to the tiny drop of water which was in the beak of that bird So my dear respected elders brothers and sisters in Islam we come to a conclusion that human discovery is limited and likewise the knowledge that has been bestowed unto us humans is once again limited Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah Luqman 
ولو أن ما في الأرض من شجرة أقلام والبحر يمده من بعده سبعة أبحر سبعة أبحر ما نفدت كلمات الله إن الله عزيز حكيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, a profound ayah. Allahu Akbar. Allah the Almighty, He says, even if all the trees on this planet, if all the trees on this planet were made into pens, all of the trees, and all of the oceans as ink, Allahu Akbar, all of the trees as pens, and all of the oceans as ink. It is upon us to ponder on each and every ayah of our powerful maker, my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the noble Qur'an, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَانُهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do they not make tadabbur of the ayat of the Qur'an? Do they not ponder and reflect on the Qur'an? Or have they got locks on their hearts? Have they got locks? Are their hearts sealed up? Allah the Almighty did not say, Afala yasma'oon al-Qur'an? Do they not hear the Qur'an? Or Afala yaqra'oon al-Qur'an? Do they not read the Qur'an? Nay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word at Do they not reflect and ponder on these verses? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now coming back to the main ayah, he says, وَلَوْ أَنَّ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ مِنْ شَجَرَةٍ أَقْلَامٌ وَالْبَحْرُ يَمُدُّهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ سَبَعَةُ أَبْحُرٍ مَا نَفِدَتْ كَلِمَاتُ اللَّهِ If all of the trees on this planet were made into pens, and all of the oceans into ink. Now imagine, just think. What a lot of ink, and what a lot of pens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, Even if all of those pens and all of that ink was there, the words of Allah the Almighty will never ever be exhausted. And this is in regard to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Allah the Almighty is most exalted in might and wisdom. This is how great Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And this is how great the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in comparison to our weak knowledge. Likewise, we have the issue of people of the jahiliyyah thinking or deeming that the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were females. They used to say that the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is all because they put their logic into it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuted all of those nonsensical assumptions of theirs. And likewise, if you were to ask someone in regard to the trees of Jannah, say, in regard to the trees of Jannah, if I were to ask one of you in regard to the trees of Jannah, could you describe for me the trees of Jannah? Can you say that the trees of Jannah look like perhaps a mango tree down the road? No. Because this is from the world of the unseen, from the realm of the unseen. So when we talk about the unseen, we have to rely on the Qur'an, and the authentic sunnah of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And where the, where the Qur'an, where the teachings of the Qur'an and the sunnah stop, we too stop. We do not transgress the limits by trying to put in our intellect and add our own stories. So now we move on to the second thing that I wanted to touch, and that is in regard to the belief in the unseen. Like I said just now, none of us, we cannot affirm or deny anything from the world of the unseen just because it is beyond our mental capacity. Just because we think that there cannot be jinnat, we cannot deny it. Because it is mentioned in the Noble Qur'an, it is mentioned in the Sunnah of our Master Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there leaves no room for us to deny either the existence of the Malaika, the angels or the existence of the jinn. Now let's begin with the world of the Malaika, the world of the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once again it is important to highlight that belief in the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the second article of Iman. 
it is the second article of Iman in regard to our faith. And this was taught to us in the very famous hadith of Jibreel. In the very famous hadith of Jibreel, this hadith is recorded in Muslim. Umar radiallahu anhu, he narrates that once we were seated with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one fine day, اطلع علينا رجل شديد بياض الثياب شديد سواد الشعر Whilst we were seated with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a man approached us, approached the gathering. He was wearing beautiful sparkling white clothes and his hair was jet black. لا يرى, عليه لا يرى عليه أثر سفر We could see no signs of journey upon him There were no signs of journey upon him He looked clean and smart ولا يعرفه منا أحد None of us knew who he was He was a new person to Medina at that time حتى جلس إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم He went straight up to رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم And he sat down by رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم I'm just skimming over the hadith because time does not permit me. Every single word has books of explanation. We can go on talking about so many things to discuss in this hadith because this is a hadith many scholars have written explanations about. Beautiful explanations about. Anyway, we'll go with the uh, face value of the hadith so as not to uh, drift away from the topic. حتى جلس إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم this man, he goes straight to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and sits by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَأَسْنَدَ رُكْبَتَيْهِ إِلَىٰ رُكْبَتَيْهِ He sits in a way that his knees were touching the knees of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he placed his hands on his thighs, teaching us how a student should sit in front of his teacher. Allahu Akbar. وَقَالْ And then he says, يَا Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِسْلَامِ Tell me about Islam. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells him about Islam. And then the second question, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni anil iman. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Iman is an tu'mina billah wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wal yawm al-akhir wa bil qadri khayrihi wa sharrihi. He says, Iman is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an tu'mina billah. وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ To believe in the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَكُتُبِهِ The books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَرُسُلِهِ The messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ To believe in the last day, the day of Qiyamah وَتُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدْرِ And also to believe in the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That good and evil is from it So this hadith, my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam highlights that Iman, to believe in the angels, is from the articles of faith. So none of us, none of us can deny the existence of the Malaika, the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For if a person were to deny the existence of the Malaika, the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is not a mu'min. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. So belief in the angels implies four essential things. Let me touch on that very briefly. Number one, it is upon us to affirm their existence, like I said in the beginning. To affirm their existence and to affirm that they are part of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not this, they are not that. They are the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are subjects of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two is to believe in the names of the angels, of those angels who we know that has been revealed to us, that has been taught to us through the Qur'an and the authentic sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As we go on, we'll discuss the few names that have been mentioned or taught to us. The third thing is to believe in the attributes of those attributes we know in regard to the malaika, in regard to their physical characteristics, all of which has been taught to us by our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And finally, it is upon us to believe, to affirm in the responsibilities which we know of in regard to some of the angels who, are, who have been entrusted with those responsibilities. Those also we will touch as we go. Now we move on to their creation. When were the Malaika created? This is the question. When were the Malaika created? Now in regard to this question, none of us have the knowledge as to exactly or to pinpoint very precisely when the angels were created. 
Because there is no text from the Quran or the Sunnah to tell us this. But there is one thing which is very clear that they were created long before mankind. That is certain. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Noble Quran, the ayat I recited at the opening, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember when he said to the angels, I am going to create a wise gerund on earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was informing the malaika just before creating Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, that I am going to create a wise gerund on earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking to the malaika, to the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that shows us that they existed before the creation of mankind. Now the angels form a world or a realm different to the realm of mankind and the realm of jinn. Their world is an extremely noble, beautiful and pure world. The world of the malaika. This word malak or malaika, malak is its singular form. When you say malak, you mean a or an angel, one angel. And when you say malaika, it is the plural of malak, which means angels. Malak and malaika. So from where did this word stem from in Arabic? In general, all of the words in Arabic stem from a root word. So malak, malaika, they stem from the root alaka, ma'laka, which means a message. And why were they known as such? Is because they brought the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. They were known as the messengers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And some scholars say that malak, this word was derived from mulk, which I think all of us know. Mulk means kingdom. And why were they known as such? Is because the minute an angel is entrusted with a responsibility or when he is in control of an affair, he is known as a malak because that particular control of that area. For example, if you take Mikail, alayhi salatu wasalam, he has been entrusted with the reins and provisions, as we, know, as we go on, we'll discuss. So he is in control with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah the Almighty has decreed that Mikail alayhi salatu wasalam will be in control of the reins and the provisions. So that is why he is known as Malak. This is the opinion of some of the scholars. Now let's move on to the physical characteristics. Now what are the malaika? What are the angels created from? Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Aisha radiallahu anha narrates anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said خُلِقَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ مِنْ نُورِ وَخُلِقَ الْجَانِ مِنْ مَارِجٍ مِنْ نَارِ وَخُلِقَ آدَمْ مِمَّا وُسِفَ لَكُمْ This is something we need to study about. We need to know more about all of these creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the more we study, the more we understand what a great and powerful maker we are subject to. And this will bring in more fear, more taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our hearts. May Allah the Almighty make us all from the people of taqwa. Ameen. So the translation of the hadith. The angels were created from light. The angels were created from light. And the jinn were created from a smokeless fire. And Adam was fashioned from that which has been described to you, i.e. clay, as we all know. Now, in regard to malaika being visible to us human beings, can we see the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or the question put right could be, has anyone from this ummah ever seen an angel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we need to understand is because the malaika are made of light, they have bodies which are of a very low density. Their bodies, unlike our bodies, their bodies are of a low density. So other than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we're talking about this ummah, other than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no one has seen the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their true form, in their true form. But they have come down in the guise of human beings and there are narrations to state that the Sahaba Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhim ajma'een to have witnessed 
a few of the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come down. But in regard to their true form, it was only Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who witnessed them directly. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam twice in his true form. And those two narrations will teach us about their size. Now let's talk about the size or the physique of Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam. Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Takweer, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ بِالْأُفُقِ الْمُبِينَ And indeed, he, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saw him, Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam, in the clear horizon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Najm, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى عِنْدَ سِدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى عِنْدَهَا جَنَّةُ الْمَأْوَى And he, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, certainly saw him in another descent. Two ayat, two verses proving that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw him twice. And please remember salawat whenever I mention his beautiful name. In the Sidratul Muntaha, he saw him at the low tree by Sidratul Muntaha. That is the utmost boundary at the seventh heaven when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went up to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the point even Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam said that I cannot dare or I dare not pass this point because I may be burnt to ashes. Recorded in Muslim, Sahih Muslim, Aisha radiallahu anha now asks Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about these two ayat. Now listen to this carefully. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replies, that was Jibreel regarding these two ayat. It was just pronouns. He saw Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explains in regard to the ayat. That is Jibreel. I never saw him in his true form Except on those, or on those, except on those two occasions. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is explaining to Aisha radiallahu anha. And he goes on to say, I saw Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam descending from the heavens and his huge physique filling the space between the heavens and the earth. Allahu Akbar. The size of Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam, his true form fills the heavens and the earth. Hadith is in Bukhari. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam descend with 600 wings. Allah. He is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now ponder my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, what a powerful maker we are subject to. Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam came down with 600 wings. Hadith is in Musnad, Imam Ahmad. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu once again says, The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam in his true form. He had 600 wings, each of which filled the horizon. And there were multicolored pearls and rubies cascading from his wings. Just imagine, what an amazing sight that would have been to behold. 600 wings with multicolored rubies, gems cascading from those wings. Allahu Akbar. What a magnificent creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at how powerful our maker is, my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam. This uh, narration was mentioned by Imam ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, in his book, Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya. And uh, he says that the sanad of the hadith, in other words, the chain of narrators of the hadith, was a good chain, an authentic chain. Now let's move on to the beauty of the malaika, the beauty of the angels. Allah the Almighty created them in a noble and a beautiful form, as He Himself, the Maker, He Himself says, "Allamahu shadidul qawa, lu mirratin fastawa." Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was taught by one mighty in power and that was Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam. He was someone free from any defect in body and mind. That was how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam. And he then rose to his true form. This is the translation of the three ayat. Now the norm is that we, when we think about malaika, when we think about angels, it is a beautiful picture that comes into our mind. On the other hand, if we were to think of devils, if we were to think of demons, it is a very ugly, scary picture that comes into our minds. Angels are noble, are beautiful, are pure. But we have to understand, it is not like how the Christians portray it to us 
Angels are not fairies. Angels are not fairies. And they are extremely beautiful, noble, but they can look or inspiring if they wish to. Because look at this description. 600 wings covering the horizon, the heavens and the earth. Look at how huge Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam is, my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam. So this is what was uh, intended when we say that they are beautiful, noble and pure. Now when we look at the incident of Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam, and this is once again to highlight that we human beings in general, we have a beautiful picture of the Malaika, what happened? Now we know what happened when Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam, the incident between Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam and the lady of the house he was in. I don't want to once again go into the depth of the story. Some scholars say her name was Zulaikha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in regard to the story. So after she tried to seduce Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam, she tried to seduce him. We know the story. The women of that town began to gossip. They started to gossip. It was a juicy piece of gossip for them. That, oh, Zulaikha, if that was her name, you know, had an illicit relationship with the slave who was in her house. And this gossip started going around all over the place. Now, the minute this lady, the lady of the house heard about it, she wanted to make a point clear to these women. So she invited all of them for a feast at her house. She invited all of the women of that town for a feast to her house. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in regard to that incident. فَلَمَّا سَمِعَتْ بِمَكْرِهِنَّ أَرْسَلَتْ إِلَيْهِنَّ وَأَعْتَدَتْ لَهُنَّ مُتَّكَأً وَآتَتْ كُلَّ وَاحِدَةٍ مِّنْهُنَّ سِكِّينًا وقالت اخرج عليهن فلما رأينه أكبرنه وقطعن أيديهن وقلن حاش لله ما هذا بشرا إن هذا إلا ملك كريم فلما سمعت بمكرهن so when she heard of their gossip when she heard of their gossip that they were talking behind her back she sent for them and prepared for them a banquet and she gave each one of them a knife she gave each one of them a knife and then she commanded Yusuf alayhi salatu wassalam now come out before them وقالت اخرج عليهن now come out before them the minute these women so the beauty of Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam, the minute they saw him, they started to admire him and began to cut their own hands instead of the fruit or the meat that was on their plates. They started to cut their own hands. She wanted to prove a point. You're talking bad about me? That I seduced a slave? Now come have a look at this amazing person and how handsome he is. And they started to cry out, وَقُلْنَ حَاشَ لِلَّهِ مَا هَذَا بَشَرَ إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا مَلَكٌ كَرِيمٌ They started to cry out all of the women, Perfect is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This cannot be a human being. This cannot be a human being. This is a noble angel. Now the reason behind mentioning this incident is to give you an idea that all of us, we have it in our minds that malaika are noble, beautiful and pure. Now coming back to their characteristics, they vary in their physical shape, size and status in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They cannot be described as male or female. They cannot be described as male or female. And the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do not eat or drink, nor do they become bowed or tired. Where do the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dwell? They dwell in the heavens. They dwell in the heavens. There are ayat to prove this. And they come down to the earth by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah the Almighty says, وَمَا نَتَنَزَّلُ إِلَّا بِأَمْرِ رَبِّكَ لَهُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِينَا وَمَا خَلْفَنَا وَمَا بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ نَسِيَّا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he's quoting the, what Jibreel alayhi salatu wa is saying, and we angels descend not except by the command of your Lord. They descend with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now moving on to the numbers of the malaika. How many are they? How many malaika are there? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the noble Quran, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُوْ And no one knows the forces of your Lord 
but he. But just to get a rough idea, there is something known as a qareen, which we will discuss if time permits. A qareen is translated as a constant companion. A constant companion. Each and every one of us, have been appointed a Qareen from the day we were born. Each and every one of us. We have an angel Qareen and a demonic Qareen. We have an angelic companion and a demonic companion. Two Qareens. We have two Qareens. Each and every one of us. So, just to give a rough idea, according to the latest world population uh, figures, say there are around what? Seven Seven odd billion human beings, there are seven odd billion malaika. There are seven odd billion malaika. And in regard to Baytul Ma'mur, Baytul Ma'mur, for your information, is a house just like Kaaba, just like Kaaba, it is in the seventh heaven, and it perfectly aligns itself with the Kaaba. And if it were to fall from the heavens, it would fall right on top of the Kaaba. It is exactly like the Kaaba in the heavens. This Baytul Ma'mur, each and every day, there is a narration in regard to that. Each and every day, 70,000 malaika go to Baytul Ma'mur to make ibadah, and then they never come back. They never come back. 70,000 angels. Allahu Akbar. Look at the numbers. They are so vast in number. There is another narration. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu narrates. This hadith is in Tirmidhi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Verily, I see what you do not see, and I hear what you do not hear. Our Master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying this. Verily, I see what you do not see, and I hear what you do not hear. The heaven is creaking, and it should creak, for there is no space even for the width of four fingers. Even for four fingers in the heavens, but there is an angel placing his head in sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the number of the malaika, my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam. Now we move on to the names of the angels. The names that have been revealed to us through the Quran and the Sunnah. We'll quickly move through that. The primary or the most powerful of them is Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, And he has been entrusted with wahi. Bringing down revelation to the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. Second in line is Mikael. Mikael alayhi salatu wasalam has been entrusted with the reins and provisions. Next we have Israfil alayhi salatu wasalam who has placed the trumpet on his lips and he is waiting for the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to blow it to signify the commencement of the day of judgment. And next in line is Malik. He is the keeper of Jahannam. He is the one who has been entrusted to look after Jahannam. His name is Malik. The next angel in, in line is Ridwan. He is the keeper of Jannah. He is the keeper of paradise. And we have Munkar and Nakir. They are the two angels who will question all of us in our graves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make that questioning easy upon us. Next we have Harut and Marut. These were two angels who were sent down some time back as a trial to mankind, as a test. Now there are many stories, many fables in regard to them, but we will stick to what is in the Quran and the Sunnah, and that says that they were sent down as a trial to mankind. Next we have Malakul Maut. Malakul Maut, otherwise known as, aka, the angel of death. Malakul Maut. Now there are some narrations that say his name is Israel, but these narrations are not that authentic, so we cannot base our statement upon that. So we say, but in other words, most of the narrations, the authentic narrations, refer to him as Malakul Maut, the angel of death. He is in charge of taking the souls with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I wanted to mention whether they have come down in the guise of human beings to test us, but time does not permit, so we'll move on to the next topic. Do the Malaika also have to face death? Do the Malaika also have to face death? Yes, indeed, all of the Malaika will face death, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنُفِقَ فِي السُورِ فَصَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ When the trumpet will be blown, every single creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is in the heavens and the earth will fall down dead. All of us have to face Malakul Maut. Even Malakul Maut has to face death. Only Allah the Almighty will remain. Now, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, we swiftly move on to the realm 
of jinn. And I think this is what you're awaiting for. We move to the realm of jinn. But anyway, this is a very, you know, an academic lecture. So you have to discuss all of the facts and place everything on the table. I can't jump into the realm of the jinn. Okay. So in regard to the world of the jinn. Now in regard to this realm, this is also from the world of the unseen. And like I said, none of us can deny the existence of jinn. Because there is a complete surah in regard to the jinn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقُتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And I have not created mankind or jinn kind except that they worship me. So all of these ayat and there are many hadith to prove the existence of jinn. Now when talking about jinn, If we go to any town, any city, any locality, we are bound to hear stories about jinn. We are bound to hear stories about jinn. And so many fables, so many fairy tales, so many superstitions have got mixed up that it is now difficult to differentiate between what is true and what is false. People have different names for the jinnas too. People have different names. They call them ghosts. They call them ghouls. They call them phantoms, spirits, evil spirits, monsters, so many names. Each town has a different name where they call the jinnat. But all of them boil down once again to jinn. This is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says that all nations, all nations or all people believe in the jinn. And they have many stories which would take a long time to narrate. No one denies the existence of the jinn except a few small group of, a few small groups of ignorant philosophers, doctors, etc. As for the elite of the masses, it is narrated that they either believed in the jinn or they had no opinion in regard to them. Now there are scholars who have done extensive research in regard to the realm of the jinn, such as Dr. Ibrahim Kamal Adham. We will talk about some of his experiences if time permits. Now he says that there is a virtual consensus amongst both the common people and the educated that jinn exists. It is a consensus. Mostly everyone, whether they like it or not, they believe that the jinnat they do exist. And he says from what has been gathered from the tales of the masses, from the stories of the masses, is that the jinn can take on various forms. They can take on various forms. And the most common, now this is not based on the Quran or the Sunnah, we will discuss as we go, but he is saying according to what the masses, according to the experiences of the masses, they say that the jinn generally take on the form of a huge snake or a black cat, a black dog or a black sheep. This is in regard to his research. And he says that strangely, most of the common folk say that if a jinn were to take on another form, It it keeps its goat feet. Even if it were to come as a black dog, it would have the feet of a goat. Even if it were to come as a black cat, it would have the feet of a goat. Even if it were to come as a human being, it would have the feet of a goat. This is according to his uh, research. And he says there was once an incident that took place in Egypt. There was a farmer. There was a farmer who was working on his uh, fields at night. So whilst he was uh, tilling away the ground, in the middle of the night, someone comes to him and asks him, Can I help you, brother? Then he's, he's shocked because this is the middle of the night, he's working all alone in his farm and someone comes up to him and offers him help. So he looks at him, the minute he looks at him, he looks down and he sees the man has goat feet. He sees that the man has goat feet. He loses it, he leaves whatever the tools he had in his hand and he runs away. From the farm, because now this is the stories that they hear, that the jinn, if they were to come, they would come with goat feet. So he runs, runs away to the border of the city, in the middle of the night now, because he's seized with terror. He runs there, and when he's going, he sees a man there. He rushes to him, help me, help me. Then that man asks him, brother, what is wrong? How can I help you? No, 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 no. In my farm, there was a man who came and offered me help, but I know he is a jinn, because he had the feet of a goat. And then this man who asked him what is wrong, he asked him, is it like my feet? And he lifts his dress. And he's got goat feet too. <laughs> this man literally faints there. So this experience was mentioned by this uh, scholar I mentioned, Dr. Ibrahim. So anyway, 
the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they say that if you do not believe in the Jinnat, you are considered a Kafir. You are out of the fold of Islam. Because you are directly rejecting the direct explicit statements of the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let's quickly discuss the definition of the term Jinn. The word Jinn in Arabic means something concealed, something hidden. There is a famous dictionary known as Lisan al-Arab, uh, the, the Arab tongue, written by Ibn Manzur, who was a North African lexicographer of the Arabic language. He says that this word Jinn comes from the root known as Jannah, which means to, not Jannah, Jannah, Jannah means to conceal, it's a word. And when you say Junna Anka, it means something is concealed from you. When you say Jannah who lay, the night enveloped him. And when you say Jannah, paradise is known as Jannah because it is a hidden garden. None of us have seen Jannah. It is known as Jannah because it is a hidden garden. And you say for the fetus in Arabic, Janin, Janin from the same root because it is hidden in uh, its mother's womb. None of us can see the fetus. And we say Mijan for a shield. The shield that warriors use in war because it conceals the fighter from his opponent. Mijan is also from the same root. And jinn also comes from the same root because they are hidden from us. We cannot generally see the jinnah. Now an important question. Are all of the jinn demons? Are all of the jinn demons? And are all demons from the jinn? Are all of the jinn demons? And are all demons from the jinn? The answer is no. The answer is no. All of the jinn are not devils. All of the jinn are not demons. Nor are all of the devils from the jinn. All of the demons are not from the jinn. I know you must be amused, but we'll go. We'll explain as we go. As we have righteous believers from the jinn. We have righteous, very pious believers from the jinn. Professor Sayyid Qutb, he says in his famous book, Fi Zilal al-Qur'an, in the shade of the Qur'an, in regard to the ayah, قُلْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it has been revealed to me that a group of the jinn listened to the Qur'an and they said, Indeed, we have heard an amazing recitation. We have heard an amazing Quran. So, Professor Sayyid Qutb, he says that this ayah alone confirms their existence, number one. It confirms their ability to listen to the Quran in the Arabic language. And it also confirms that they were created with the intuition or the potential to believe or to disbelieve. This ayah alone. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says in his book Al-Furqan al-Kabir, a jinn may go to a person in a desert, a person needing help in a remote land, and he may go and give him water. The man is dying out of thirst, a jinn may go and give that man water, and then may call him to Islam. A righteous jinn will do that. He'll go to a person who is starving, perhaps in a remote desert, give him water and then call him to uh, Islam. And then he goes on to mention his personal experience with a jinn in Turkey. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. This was when he was imprisoned in Egypt. He was, this was when he was imprisoned in Egypt. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, my dear brothers in Islam, not an ordinary scholar, Allahu Akbar. He wouldn't hesitate or bat an eyelid to speak the truth out in front of oppressors or tyrants. And this was why he was imprisoned. May Allah have mercy upon him. So whilst he was imprisoned in Egypt, what happened was, he was very famous in Turkey. Now the prince of Turkey sends message to the governor of Egypt that the scholar Ibn Taymiyyah has done so much of good in Turkey. So the governor of Egypt was amazed as to how this scholar is imprisoned in our prisons. And the prison was like a well. It was like a well where you drop the person in the middle inside. No one can come out. But to see what had happened was, there was a jinn who loved Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, who was an ardent follower of Shaykh al-Islam, and he had gone to Turkey in the guise of Shaykh al-Islam, and he had started calling people towards Islam, and Shaykh al-Islam, the real Shaykh al-Islam, had the habit of giving food or feeding people the minute they come to Islam. The minute they embrace Islam, he used to give them food to eat. So this jinn also went there and did the same thing. 
called people towards Islam in the guise of Shaykh al-Islam and started giving food. That made people think, oh, Shaykh al-Islam has really come. So later on, Shaykh al-Islam explained to his students that it wasn't me. I was imprisoned in the well in Egypt, but it was a jinn that impersonated me and went and did what I was doing because it loved me. It was a good and righteous jinn. So then his students asked him, could it not have been an angel? Could that not have been an angel? Then Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah clarifies that it could not have been an angel because the angels never ever disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون. They will never disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this jinn, he lied. He lied that he was Ibn Taymiyyah. He said, I am Ibn Taymiyyah. So that was a lie. If it was an angel, an angel would never lie. So it is 100% sure that it was a jinn, but a righteous jinn. Now as for the second part of the question, are all devils from the jinn? Once again, no. As we have devils from the jinn as well as mankind. We have devils from the jinn as well as mankind. Allah the Almighty says in the Noble Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ عَدُوًّا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنْسِ وَالْجِنِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And thus we have made for every prophet an enemy devils from mankind and jinn. Allahu Akbar. There are devils from mankind and jinn. Now in regard to their origin and their creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ صَلْصَالٍ مِنْ حَمَئٍ مَسْنُونَ وَالْجَانَّ خَلَقْنَاهُ مِنْ قَبْلُ مِنْ نَارِ السَّمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And we did certainly create man from dried sounding clay of an altered black mud, and the jinn we created a four time, in other words, long before, from a smokeless flame of a scorching fire. This is the ayah that talks about the creation of the jinn. So the verses clearly state that jinn were created before man, and that they were created from a smokeless flame. So this statement, smokeless flame, Ibn Abbas, Ikrima, Mujahid, al Hassan, and other scholars of Tafasir, Ridwan Allah Ta'ala alayhi majma'in, they say that what the... In other words, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant by a smokeless flame is the purest and the best part of the flame. This was what was used in regard to the creation of jinn. But that doesn't mean that the jinnas are fiery creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if you were to think of a jinn, it is one big flame walking around. No. Jinn are not fiery at all times. The proof for this is that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in his masjid. He was praying. He was praying salah, this, this hadith is narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha, and while she was praying, the, the narration goes along the lines of these words, suddenly he outstretched his hand like this while she was praying. So Aisha radiallahu anha later on asked him, Ya Rasulullah, why did you do that? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied that whilst I was praying, a devil came towards me from the jinn. A devil came towards me from the jinn, and I got hold of him, and I held him so tight, so tight, the words Rasulullah wasallam used were, I held him so tight until I felt the coolness of his tongue on my hand. Until I felt the coolness of his tongue on my hand. So if they were fiery creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would be very hot. But on the other hand, Rasulullah is saying, I felt the coolness of his tongue on my hand. And the narration goes on to say that Rasulullah went on to say that if not for the dua of Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam, I would have tied him up for all of you all to see the next morning. But Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam had prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Ya Allah, do not give anyone after me a kingdom like how you had given me. And we all know that the jinns were under Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam. So respecting that dua, Rasulullah wasalam, did not tie the jinn up. Now let's talk about the various type of jinn. Ibn Abdul Bar, he says that amongst the scholars, the jinn have several names or several categories. When you're talking about a general jinn, you would say jinni. Jinni. When you talk about a general jinn. There is another type known as Amir. Amir, this type of jinn is the jinn who lives with people. Now we could have many Ummar over here in this place from the jinn. I hope I'm not scaring you. Because they are the jinn that live with people. 
They dwell with people. They walk around. They, they, they are known as Amir or Umar, the plural. They walk around. They dwell with people. And then we have another type that attaches itself to small children. This is from the statements of the scholars. The scholars who have experience with jinnah. And this jinn is known as arwah, arwah, from ruh arwah. They attach themselves to little children. And then we have shaitan, the devil, the demon. And then we have a type of jinn that is more powerful than that particular category. It is uh, from the shaitan, but a very evil type. And that type is known as marid. It is an extremely evil type. You could say the top brass of the shaitan, if you will. And then we have an extremely rebellious and strong type of jinn known as Ifrit. Ifrit. This is another type. This type, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, uh, we will talk about it in the incident of Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam just to highlight very quickly about he, the, the strength of Ifrit. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasalam is reported to have said that the jinn of three types. This is a hadith. This is a hadith. The jinn of three types. One type which flies through the air. One type which flies through the air. The second category which is like snakes and dogs. Which is like snakes and dogs. And the third type is the Amir which moves from one place to another. Now can animals see jinn and angels? Can animals see jinn and angels? As we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created our eyesight different. For if you go to take some animals their eyesight is black and white or monochrome. So likewise can animals see jinn and angels? The answer is yes. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, and this hadith is in Muslim, إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ سُيَاحَ الدِّيكَ فَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ فَإِنَّهَا رَأَتْ مَلَكَ If you hear the rooster crowing, if you ever hear the rooster crowing, hadith is in Muslim, authentic hadith. If you hear the rooster crowing, immediately pray to Allah for his bounty, because the rooster has indeed seen an angel. The rooster is crowing because it has seen an angel. Hadith is a Muslim. Then we have another hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, وَإِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ نُهَاكَ الْحَمِيرُ أَوْ نُبَاحَ الْكَلْبِ فَاسْتَعِيذُوا بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ فَإِنَّهَا تَرَى مَا لَا تَرَى If you hear the bray of a donkey, now I doubt we'll find donkeys in Karambo, but still, if you hear the bray of a donkey, or if you hear the barking of a dog, if you hear the barking of a dog, seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that, for those animals have seen what you do not see. In other words, they have seen a devil, the explanation of that narration. So how many times we hear the dogs barking at night? The minute we hear the dog barking, we have to immediately say, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan rajim in accordance with the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the dog is barking because it has seen a jinn, an evil jinn. Now moving to shaitan very swiftly. Who is shaitan? Is he from the angels or is he from the jinn? The ayat and the narrations point out that he is from the jinn and he was never. Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah says that shaitan was not from the angels even for the blink of an eye. He was from the jinn. Scholars like Ibn Kathir rahimahullah mention that he, I mean jinn, shaitan was on earth long long time back. Long time ago. And they caused much corruption, bloodshed and all of that. And that is why the malaika, they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, are you going to create another creation that is going to cause corruption on the face of this earth? Because of their experience with the jinn. So when they caused so much of corruption, Allah the Almighty sent down an army of angels to chase them away and destroy them. So the angels chased away the jinn to remote far islands and chased them away to places of dirt and filth. And they took capture of shaitan and went up to the heavens. And shaitan, when he went up there, he reformed. He became good. And that is how he was living in the heavens until the incident where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the angels, including shaitan, to prostrate to Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. And he refused to do so because of his arrogance and because of his pride. And that resulted in him being accursed forever. So we move on to the ugly appearance of the devils. Now like I said in the beginning, the malaika are beautiful, noble and pure, but the devils are ugly. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّهَا شَجَرَةٌ تَخْرُجُ فِي أَصْلِ الْجَحِيمِ طَلُعُهَا كَأَنَّهُ رُؤُوسُ الشَّيَاطِينَ Talking about the tree of Zakum, which will be the food for the denizens of Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all from the blazing inferno of Jahannam. 
the tree of Zakum, its roots are from the bottom of the fire of Jahannam and its fruits will be like the heads of the devils. The description given to that tree is the fruits of that tree will be like the heads of the devils. So from that we understand that the devils are indeed an ugly sight to behold. The shaitan has two horns. Now I know you must be thinking of the pictures in cartoon and all of that with, with the shaitan having two horns. Well, the narration attests it. The shaitan does have two horns. Hadith is in Muslim. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu uh, narrates. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Do not pray when the sun is rising or when the sun is setting because it rises between the two horns of shaitan. And the scholars who commentate on the hadith, they explain that when the sun is rising, shaitan, he goes and stands in such a way that the sun rises from behind him and whoever is praying would be praying for him. So we, we do not pray in accordance to the words of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The food, drink and marriage of the jinn. The food of the jinn, according to the hadith in Bukhari, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam once commanded Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu to bring him some stones to purify himself after relieving himself. And he advised Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, do not bring bones or the dung or the droppings of animals. And then Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu asked him as to why and he said, I prayed to Allah and I asked Allah that the jinn should not pass by any bone or any dung but they would find, but that they would find food on it. Now the dung, the droppings of our animals are the food of their animals. The droppings of our animals or the dung of our animals is the food for their animals. And the bones that we throw, and in another narration it says that the bones we throw mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the minute it falls into their hands, it becomes full of flesh and it becomes food for the jinn. Now in regard to their marriage, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says in his book Majmu al-Fatawa, humans and jinn may get married. There is a possibility. You can't negate it. They may get married and they may produce children. This happens often and is well known. Imam Malik rahimahullah, he says, it may happen but I do not approve of it because, you know, mischief could take place. A woman could become pregnant and the minute you go ask her who is your husband, she would say a jinn came and you know, a jinn made me pregnant. So this could cause a lot of corruption, this could cause a lot of mischief. So Imam Malik rahimahullah, he says that it is not advisable to give room to that because there could, ha- there could be, you know, you're opening the door for a lot of mischief and corruption. So he did not approve of the idea. Now in regard to where the jinn live. They inhabit the same planet as we do, but where do they live? They live in ruins, they live in deserted houses, deserted buildings, toilets, garbage dumps, graveyards. And that is why we have narrations that prohibit us from praying in the toilets because of the najasa. And that is why when we enter the toilets, we recite, according to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubasi wal khaba'is. Ya Allah, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you, I seek protection in you from the male and female devils. Because that is where they live in. In another narration, Rasulullah ﷺ is reported to have said that if a person goes into the uh, washroom or the toilet reciting the dua and saying Bismillah in the name of Allah, that would result in a covering for him. In other words, his aura will not be exposed to the jinn. But if you do not go in with the name of Allah, you're exposing your aura to the jinnah, the male and female devils that live in the toilets. And we are prohibited from praying in the graveyards due to shirk. Because shirk could occur from there. I mean, grave worship and other, other, other issues could prop up from there. Now, the jinnah, they love to sit between the shade and the sun. If you have a place where it's partially shaded and there is partial sun coming in, they love to sit exactly there. And that is why there are many authentic narrations prohibiting us from sitting in such places. In regard to their abilities, they can move from place to place very quickly. And in regard to Ifrit, that story is uh, mentioned in the Quran when Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam wanted to get the throne of the queen of Yemen from Yemen to Jerusalem. From Yemen to Jerusalem, he asked his coat as to who can bring me the throne of that queen from Yemen to Jerusalem. قال عفريت من الجن أنا آتيك به قبل أن تقوم من مقامك. When Sulaiman عليه الصلاة والسلام 
asked them, a jinn known as Ifrit, he stood up and said, I will bring the throne to you before you even stand up from your seat. Before you stand up from your seat, the throne will be here. This is their power. They can move from place to place very, very fast. And once again, because their bodies are also light in density, they can possess human beings. They can possess human beings. There are individuals who reject human possession, but there are many scholars who agree upon that jinns can possess human beings and uh, the only way to get the jinn out is through exorcisms. Now, hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. Anas radiallahu anhu narrates, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, the shaitan, the shaitan flows through the children of Adam like their blood. Or the, 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 the shaitan flows through the veins of the children of Adam. Because of their low density bodies, they can flow through the veins of the children of Adam. So, my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, we quickly move on to the closing note because I think we are running out of time. Uh, and this is in regard to, I wanted to touch this in the beginning itself, but without giving you all an introduction of the jinnas, I could not go into it. Now, after their abilities, we have in regard to uh, superstitious beliefs. Because now, like I said in the beginning about the jinnah, there are many myths, there are many fables, there are many stories in regard to the jinnah. So much to the extent that it is difficult for us to differentiate between what is true and what is false. So, normally the sicknesses, the harm caused by the jinn are a few. Number one being intense fear, and they also cause psychological and nervous diseases such as depression, anxiety, tension, epilepsy, waswas, you know, the evil whispering, personality disorders, insanity, etc. Many of the psychological diseases are because of the evil work of the jinnat. And then physical sicknesses that human medicine is unable to treat is also due to jinnat. Hallucinations, stirring up hatred between spouses, between business partners, good friends, family, all of is which, which is the work, the mischief of the jinnat. But, just because something happens, we don't have to immediately resort to saying that, oh, this must be the work of the jinnat, or this must be the handicraft of the jinnat, because this is also a type of waswas. And my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, the jinnat, they live off our fear. When we have fear, they live off it. Now like I said, we are the best creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need not fear the jinnat, nor any other creation for that matter, other than our maker, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So most of the people who are afflicted with this problem, with the problem of fearing the jinnat over everything, is because of their ignorance of tawheed. Because they haven't fully understood tawheed. Tawheed is la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah. There is no God worthy of worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. None has power or might other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no power, no might, for anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we completely understand this, internalize this, we will not fear any of these ex- other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is one narration just to tell you how rumors, not a narration, a story actually, how rumors go all over the place resulting in people believing all kinds of mumbo jumbo. Now this same scholar mentions another incident in Egypt. There was once a very rich man a very rich man who, who had a huge mansion. He passed away, he died, and now the inheritors, the children, the children were thinking of selling the house. They, they could give the house for a fantastic price because the house was acres and it was a huge mansion with gardens and you had statues with water flowing from the mouth, spouts, and all of these things, so many rooms. So they put up the house for sale. But then suddenly a rumor began to spread that there was an evil ifrit jinn that had inhabited that house and was haunting the house. So now the family was all upset and even though they had put up the house for sale, nobody was interested because now the news was going around, the house is haunted, the house is haunted. They tried their best to try and sell it, but no one came forward. But suddenly a man comes and says, now say for example they were quoting a hundred million, he comes and says, you know, your house is haunted, nobody is going to buy your house. I offer you a quarter of the price, 
25 million. I offer you a quarter of the price, 25 million. We close the deal today. Now, just before they thought, okay, they were, they were, they gave up hope because the, the rumor had, you know, gone all over the place and they thought, at least let's get rid of it now. It's a haunted house for 25 million. One youngster comes up and tells them, you know what? Let me do this for you all. I'm not scared of any ifrit or any jinn for that matter. Let me go inside the house and let me investigate. Let me spend one night in that house. That boy was related to them. So he says, let me spend one night in that house. Afterwards, after I tell you if there is a jinn, if there is an ifrit, you go ahead with the deal. If not, don't go ahead. Why are you going to sell the house for part of the price? So they agreed. So that night, this youngster, this young boy, was a very brave boy. He takes a gun with him for safety, to kill a jinn anyway, he takes a gun with him and he goes to the house and spends the night. So whilst he was sleeping, now he got ready to sleep and he extinguishes the candle and lays down to sleep. After a few minutes, somebody pulls his blanket. Somebody pulls his blanket. Now he was you know, dropping off to sleep, so he pulls his blanket back up again. And somebody pulls the blanket again. He pulls it up again. The third time the blanket goes off completely. Then he jumps up and says, who is it? Then suddenly a booming voice says, I am a freak. I have come here to possess you. Get out of this house before I possess you. Now this boy scrambles for the gun. And he starts looking around but no one to be seen. And suddenly he bumps into someone and he places the gun at the head of that thing. And he says, who are you? Tell me who are you? Then the person again says, I am a freak. I am a freak. So then the boy says, okay, Ifrit, if you don't tell me who you really are, I'm just going to blow your brains out. Then the man says, okay, okay, I'm not Ifrit. I'm not Ifrit. The, the boy pulls this man and comes to the middle and then lights the candle. And he sees a black, naked, ugly man. A black, naked, ugly man. So, he asks him, what are you doing here? So, this man says, I am a poor man. I am a poor man. I have no money, I have nothing, I was struggling to find a job. And a man comes up to me suddenly one fine day, and he tells me, if you agree to go live in this mansion, I'll give you a monthly salary. All you have to do is, the minute you see someone coming, there is a drum there. You start beating the drum, go to the roof and start shouting like a, a ghoul, a, a phantom, like an evil spirit, and you scare the people away. You do that, I pay you monthly a good price. So this man was doing this. The young boy, the next day morning, he drags this black man to the inheritors and he tells them the whole story. And whilst they were talking, the buyer who offered quarter the price, he comes walking with his 25 million to pay for the house. And then the black man says, he is my employer. He is the one who employed me. So you see, I mean, this man wanted to drop the price of the house, break the market price of the house. So he employed a person to do all of these antics to make the whole town believe as if the house was haunted, resulting in the price going down to a fraction. And he wanted to make a good deal out of that. So my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, like I said, it all begins with fear. The jinns, the devils, the demons, they feed off of our fears. So it is upon us not to fear. And this is upon Tawheed that la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. It is only through the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can any creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala harm us. But in reality, in reality, if the jinn are disturbing us, it is upon us to go to proper raqis. Proper exorcists, in other words, people who are experienced in doing exorcisms. Not people who write mumbo jumbo and they write things on eggs and do all of these things. These, and like I said in the beginning, apple versus nakal. If it is not mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah, it cannot be from our deen. It cannot be from our deen. We have people writing numbers, burning cloths and doing what not, all of which are superstitions, all of which are outside the fold of Islam. You know, you have people doing what not to 
uh, prove that they can get out a jinn. You know, they sacrifice an animal in the middle of the house. They do this. They ask you to take the blood of this animal and do something. They ask you to take hundred eggs and do something. All of which does not bring about any results. Nothing. You can treat yourself with the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And mainly if you want to be safe and stay away from all of these problems, follow the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in regard to the adhkar, the daily adhkar, the daily adhkar, the ayatul kursi and all of the adhkar, and stick to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, Allah the Almighty will protect all of us. Inshallah ta'ala we hope to have a lecture specifically on magic, superstitions, you know, in regard to amulets, talismans, love charms, spells, potions, all of these things, inshallah. Because this lecture, I cannot really delve into the topic because I had to cover angels and then the jinn. So we will have angels and demons part 2, where we talk about all of those topics, inshallah ta'ala, under the light of the Quran and the authentic sunnah. So with that we conclude today's session. I hope and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he made it beneficial for all of us. And may He, the Almighty, forgive all of our sins, and may He accept all of our good deeds, and may He unite us once again in future talks and sessions so that we drink from the fountain of divine knowledge, and may He unite all of us just as how He united us tonight in the gardens of Jannah with our beloved Master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.